Osearch just wrapped up its 43rd expedition off the Carolinas. The biggest accomplishment included tagging a great white shark named Crystal. I spoke with the Osearch founder about Crystal and found out how she is giving scientists a deeper look at our oceans. It's a story you'll only see on ABC News 4. Meet Crystal. She's a 10 foot subadult female. Osearch met the 460 pound great white shark off North Carolina's Crystal Coast. She is the first shark studied during Expedition Carolina's 2022 and the 84th sampled and tagged shark in Osearch's Western North Atlantic white shark study. Once she's tagged, the Osearch team is able to get a clearer picture of our waterways. The rest of it is the type of stuff that helps us understand where and when they're mating or what the toxicology of the animal is or the bacteria that's on the animal for human kind of biomedical research, as well as understanding the bacteria that's in their mouths. Chris Fisher is the founder of Osearch. He says when the sample results come back, his team is seeing some concerning new data. Region. We are seeing that these sharks have a lot more kind of toxic characteristics inside of them when they're up north eating seals. It seems like when they move back down south and they're primarily on fish and squid or the odd dead whale, uh, that they have an opportunity to forage on. We're not seeing them be quite as toxic down south as we do see them up north. Fisher tells us the weather had a big impact on their three-week expedition here as well, with rough seas plaguing the trip. Once the seas are over three or four feet, because you kind of feel like you could tear it off the side of the ship, which could be catastrophic for the ship. Also, you can't really get the animals in there safely or humans in there safely. So far, the blood test from Crystal shows she's a relaxed shark and has low stress levels. With new details coming in from her samples, Fisher is hopeful Crystal will continue to give them some new insight into the oceans she calls home. And Charison, we can actually uh, track uh, the really the uh, chill crystal, the shark, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually super interesting. Yeah. You can uh, monitor crystals location along mm -hmm. with other tagged sharks mm -hmm. uh, in the Osearch shark tracker. We actually have a link posted right now in the story at abcnews4.com. That is so cool. Yeah. Thank you, man. Three candidates are left in the DD2 superintendent's search. Each has at least 15 years experience in education. Dr. Brenda Hafner presented first. She says her leadership style is hit the ground learning. Dr. Hafner says she will do that by engaging, being an active listener and reflecting. I will spend those first 45 days and beyond listening, learning and leading in an effort to build trust foster transparency, and cultivate transformation. Think comprehensively. Next up, Dr. William Shane Robbins. He's the only candidate who has been a superintendent before. Dr. Robbins says building relationships is at the core of his plan being superintendent. He wants to always keep one thing in mind when making decisions about the district. That if I can look in the mirror, and if you all can look in the mirror, and we can say, this is in the best interest of our students, then even though it may not work out the way we expected it to work out, it's a good decision. Dr. Wesley Trimble says his leadership style is all about empowering others. He wants to make others feel valued like teachers, board members, parents, and students. Dr. Trimble says he wants to be right in the middle of things. That means being in the classroom, on the school buses, and meeting with principals and staff of each school. What happens at the school level, especially down to the classroom, and the interaction between teacher and student, that's what's ingrained in my mind. Every decision I make, I play it out in my head. How will this impact that interaction? Board members had a chance to publicly question each candidate. Board Chair Gail Hughes says it's important for the board to get a feel for the leadership style of each candidate, but there is still work to do on each candidate before a decision is made. We are using every opportunity that we can to get all feedback that we are able to get and, and get to know these candidates. And we may even be visiting some of their communities um, to check out, you know, to talk with some of their constituents or, or some of their community members and, and as well as their faculty and staff. In 2018, Tucson Seafood and Garden City took sale as a simple local seafood distributor for some of the best restaurants across the state. But when they were forced to close their doors amidst the start of the coronavirus pandemic, 
Owner and chef Dylan Foster says new pandemic friendly business ideas came to the surface. ABC 15's Emma Parkhouse shows us how their will to stay afloat turned the pandemic or parts of it into a blessing. That March 18th day for a lot of businesses, unfortunately, locally, that was the last day. You know, at least for a little bit of time, for a while. For us, it was our first day. You know, we hit the ground running. When the pandemic led Governor Henry McMaster to shut down restaurants and businesses in March 2020, chef and owner of Two Sons Seafood, Dylan Foster, says they weren't going to sink. Between our fishermen and my team, there was about 25 people that looked at us that day and said, how are we going to feed our families now? Having two sons under two of his own at the time, Foster says they scraped their business model and got to work, completely reimagining their business model. They became the first fresh seafood delivery market where customers and restaurant retailers could order their ocean favorites completely online and have it delivered. And Foster's team pushed him to put his chef skills to work, baiting yet another COVID safe business adventure in 2020. We developed our, our recipes and our cooking classes because nobody was eating at restaurants and seafood is kind of the no man's land, right? So we, we can eat, cook beef and chicken and pork comfortably at home, but seafood was like a little scary. The cooking classes also turned into creating take home, cook it yourself meal kits, including everything from the seasonings, seafoods and instructions. Both have taken over as their full time business as they're prepared in house every morning. Foster says since the start of the pandemic, they've quadrupled the number of classes they teach from four to 16 every month. COVID ended up being a blessing for our business uh, because it forced us to get out of a, a norm to get creative, to think outside of the box.